So um, we're going to start our afternoon session with um, uh, Professor Ricardo Toledo um, Silva. Uh, I, I thought of Silva and I couldn't get it. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, who will be followed by Paul Lewis and uh, and then uh, Vera uh, will be the moderator of the afternoon, or Gianni, the moderator of the afternoon session. And hopefully, we can also have some time to continue the conversation. <coughs> okay. Well, could we? Yes. Um, I would like to raise some uh, some questions on both sides of uh, of the discussion started this morning. One is the uh, academic, methodological side, and the other one is the uh, pragmatic and uh, how public works of such a dimension could take place in uh, amid a f fiscal crisis as, as we are living today. And um, the title of this uh, presentation says a little bit about that, uh, new prospects of integration when you have a situation of urban waters under threat, on, under threat uh, on, uh, 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 considering all the possible standpoints, because uh, we have problems of, uh, of uh, intense floods, we have water shortage, uh, we have problems of electricity generation altogether. And uh, paradoxically, when you have a lot of problems altogether in parallel, it's uh, perhaps easier to find out a solution for all of them because we must uh, face these problems. And, uh, and the speculation, the hypothesis in this presentation is exactly that, that altogether this prob these problems possibly uh, uh, have a solution that is impossible if we consider each sector uh, 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 insulately. Um, <coughs> we have two crises from which we have lessons learned. One is uh, very recent urban floods of, uh, of uh, uh, 09 to 11, um, when we had most of the Sao Paulo region reservoirs um, completely full and uh, uh, with a, an incredible uh, continuity of rain of about 45 days that uh, nullified all the possibility of retention on the reservoirs themselves because it was so continuous and so intense the rain that uh, the reservoirs acted as if they didn't exist. The, the, the water just passed through. Uh, so a few years after, uh, by the ending of uh, 2013, uh, we realized that we were facing the opposite problem <coughs> with uh, of, uh, an uh, intense shortage of water that we are experienci experiencing until now. Um, I would raise uh, two, two sorts of complexities to be considered to face these problems. One, uh, the scale complexity, how do we consider the regional insert, insertion of a metropolitan area as Sao Paulo, 20.5 uh, uh, million inhabitants, and uh, a complexity of scope. How could we share infrastructure and operation in the integrated systems? And uh, <coughs> at the end, I will make some consideration about metropolitan navigation and strategic uh, challenges. Uh, because as I told in the, this morning, I think it's very interesting, the project uh, developed by the FAWUSP team on, under the coordination of Alexandre. But uh, <coughs> to be uh, uh, transformed into a reality in terms of implementation, there are some uh, scale and scope uh, challenges that must be faced. Well, 
<coughs> you have already had an idea on the insertion of Sao Paulo State. This is the Sao Paulo State into South America and of the river uh, uh, topology. I mean, the, this river flows to the interior, to the hinterland, goes to the, the borderline with Paraguay and Argentina, and will join the ocean just uh, southwards in uh, uh, between, uh, uh, after Uruguay, uh, between Montevideo and Buenos Aires. It's not shown in this map. It's uh, southern, yes. And uh, <coughs> uh, this area here, the, the, this part of the river, in the westwards from Sao Paulo uh, metropolitan region, is uh, used for navigation, for hydropower, uh, for irrigation, for all the uses you can have in a river of this, uh, of this nature. This is the uh, view, a general view of the hydrographic network in the state. Here is the, the region, uh, the metropolitan region is about here. And uh, the, r the main river flows southwards. It's not only, the, uh, it's not, the, uh, there are other important rivers in the state. Uh, this is in the, the Paranapanema, it's very important for hydropower. <coughs> And this river that's the, uh, to which the Tieté is tributary, that's the uh, Paraná River, this is very important for hydropower and navigation as well. <coughs> there is uh, a very sharp concentration of demand in the eastern part of the state. This red area here is the, uh, what we consider the Alto Tieté River Basin. The, uh, this is a, a segment of the Tieté Basin uh, that <coughs> roughly coincides with the, the urban uh, concentration of the metropolitan region. The metropolitan region itself is a, a little, has a little bit different uh, 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 border uh, 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 configuration, but uh, roughly all the urban concentration is here. And this is a, <coughs> a relationship we think, uh, between the availability, of the natural availability of water and the population. As you see, <coughs> we are here we have 432% of demand uh, regarding the, uh, uh, the supply internally to, the, to this region. It means that we have to import water from the neighbor uh, uh, hydraulic segments of the, the, the neighbor basins and, and must have uh, huge uh, reservation capacities. Otherwise, during the, the dry season, we wouldn't have water. And you have others are in the borderline, in the limit, 95%, 82%. Here, there is some, uh, uh, there is a possible buffer, but there are other problems involved. And here <coughs> you have a neighbor area in which you are, have only 2% of usage uh, regarding the availability. There is a plenty of water here. But this map is two dimensional. And uh, this area is about uh, 700 meters below the level of this, uh, of this area. And this is why it's difficult to. to shift water from, uh, from here to there because of the energetic contents of this uh, pumping. <coughs> so we have a permanent cha challenge in Sao Paulo, floods and, uh, floods and droughts. Um, we, we, we clearly see uh, sort of an environmental change, but we cannot assure that these are all uh, due to uh, a sort of a climatic change or because of the, uh, of the very dense uh, urban tissue that, uh, that evolved there. And for us, <coughs> that uh, uh, work with the actual policies without a supply of infrastructure, it's meaningless because it doesn't matter if this change is uh, 
<coughs> is derived from a uh, climatic problem or of a, of a urban process uh, created by the, the uh, metropolitan concentration itself. The effects are the same, that we have this alternance uh, uh, frequent, uh, each time more frequent between floods and droughts. And the adaptation <coughs> of the urban structures uh, pass uh, through a concept that's very important for us, that's the cascading failure of infrastructure. As far as all of these sectors are interlinked, uh, when you have one of these systems failing, you have as a consequence the other one failing as well. So it's not <coughs> by uh, a coincidence that we have at the same time today uh, water shortage, energy shortage, and also floods because um, the, the specific location of the metropolitan area is not the location of the, uh, the water supply reservoirs, which are uh, much uh, far away from there. So you do not have enough rain in the uh, water supply system. At the same time, you have heavy rains uh, provoking uh, flash floods in the urbanized area. It's a paradox, but, but this is what happens. And <coughs> this, all of these uh, raise new prospects of cross-sector integration. Uh, we have a hierarchy of uses, and that must be considered, and, and I think it's an important dimension to be considered in the project presented this morning. First of all, <coughs> human water supply, both in terms of the pollution and water security. I mean the backup of, uh, of quantities. Well, it, uh, this is, is quality and this is quantity, and we have to face both of them all together. Uh, in second, uh, the second priority in the metropolitan area is flood control. The third, in energy safety. I will show you how works the energy uh, system in the, uh, in the expanded metropolitan area. Industrial use, irrigation, and navigation. <coughs> when I talked to the team uh, of the uh, Hydra Nell, um, I always point out uh, that uh, it's a very interesting project, but it must be uh, inserted correctly in the hierarchy of water use. It, it, it has real chance, provided that it firstly consider all the, uh, the conditions established by the uh, preceding, uh, preceding use in terms of, uh, of water hierarchy. <coughs> um, there are some rules that we, we, we must uh, observe here. One of the challenges we have when we talk about uh, solutions with uh, uh, normal, normally with architects, uh, urbanists, and uh, landscape designers, um, <coughs> the, there is always a question between structural and non-structural solutions or localized or uh, huge development. And one of the points that uh, make uh, non-structural measures very weak in terms of, uh, of the strategic uh, consideration is that their efficiency is not adequately quantified. You say, well, we have to face huge floods. Then you say, well, let's, uh, let's put on the spot uh, um, uh, 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 drainage, uh, 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 how do you say, uh, floors that, uh, that drain the water, not uh, asphaltic concrete, uh, pervious, yes, pervious pavements. Uh, uh, let's, uh, let's consider uh, green fields, parks, gardens, etc., etc. Well, first, the urban land has a tangible price. When you make a park, you have to disappropriate area that's already developed and this has a cost. 
Second, what's the efficiency of a park uh, when compared to, uh, to a pound, to a, a detention pound? We've made this calculation. The detention pound is, uh, occupies a, a, an area that's significantly uh, 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 less uh, important than the, the park or the, or, the, or the public garden. Then it does not <coughs> compete with the efficiency of an, uh, an operated detention system. Uh, this is, a, a, I think, an important challenge for urban design and, uh, <coughs> and non-structural proposals, generally speaking. Uh, here is the, the, uh, uh, how relate the metropolitan area and the Alto Tietê River Basin. This red line is the uh, water division, is the, uh, is the, uh, the borderline of the hydraulic system of the Alto Tietê segment, and this is the metropolitan area of Sao Paulo, this, this one here. <coughs> this area, the metropolitan area, is about 8,000 uh, square kilometers. This area of the Alto Tietê River Basin is about 5,000 kilometers. But <coughs> as you can see, most of the population is within the borders of the Alto Tietê River system. When you consider <coughs> the population of about 20.5 uh, uh, 20 uh, million inhabitants and consider the 8,000 square kilometers here, you will have something as two, uh, 2,500 uh, 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 people per square kilometers, roughly. When you consider only these borders inside the river basin, then <coughs> it, uh, it goes to 4,000 people per square kilometer. And this is a concentration that uh, unbearable in terms of, uh, of water uh, uh, supply and flood control. As you see, all the, the waters for flood control flow to a unique, to a, this only river here. This one has its natural flow uh, going to its a tributary of Tietê. But for uh, flood control operation, its course is inverted here, and it comes to, the, uh, uh, to form these reservoirs here. Alexandria already referred to them. This is the system <coughs> of flood control. You have one only, only this uh, main uh, backbone to, to have the, the flood control. And here is the scheme of the uh, Pinheiros Basin with the, uh, no, sorry, here, the Pinheiros Basin, which is inverted not, not only for the purpose of energy gener generation, but also for the sake of controlling, of keeping the, uh, the flows under control in the case of huge uh, of, uh, of flash floods. Well, one strategic decision we took some years ago in, 20, in 2007 was to enlarge the borders, the boundaries for planning and uh, public works. Why did do that? Uh, did we do it? Because <coughs> when you consider the metropolitan region here, the concentration is, is, is unbearable in terms of water planning. But when you consider all this region, <coughs> the population raises from 20.5 million to 32 million in all this region. But the area raises from 8,000 square kilometers from here to about uh, 50,000 square kilometers in the, what we call the macro metropolis. <coughs> and within these boundaries, uh, the challenges on water supply, flood control, and energy safety are more bearable than inside the metropolitan 
region itself. Uh, that's what uh, I called before the scale complexity. We must consider now the whole scale of the problem. That's different from the past. Now, <coughs> uh, it, this, is, uh, this is specifically uh, related to water security in terms of quality and quantity. Uh, we have uh, the reversions as integral part of this uh, strategic action. And we have the scenarios in terms of water demand. For the whole of the macro metropolitan area, we forecast a growth of about 60 cubic meters per second to the year uh, 2035. And if we manage <coughs> to, uh, to to adopt uh, measures of uh, demand control, we could drop it to uh, about 28 cubic meters per second. It's, uh, uh, there are uh, several programs of, uh, of demand control under, uh, 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 under uh, uh, implementation. And actually, we, uh, I think we, we will get this, uh, uh, this result. But uh, here, you see the macrometropolitan interconnections. Uh, is that map I told you before, you have here plenty of water. But the problem is that when you consider the, uh, uh, the other scale, the, the third dimension, then you realize that the energetic contents here is too high to, to pump water to the metropolitan area. <coughs> and what we have here in the eastern part of the metropolitan region is a number of reservoirs which are primarily devoted to flood control. And uh, during the dry season, they have uh, an important uh, prime role in, uh, uh, in water supply. For the major water supply, we have <coughs> a reversion from this, uh, this system that comes from another state, these rivers, Kamandukai and Kurumbatai, come from the neighbor state of Minas Gerais. And here, the rainy season is completely different from here. This is why we have, at the same time, floods here and droughts here. It's, uh, 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 and, and it's parallel, it's exactly at the same moment. And the energetic use, I told you, is uh, on this reservoir, we have <coughs> seven, about 700, 720 meters uh, of potential, and each uh, cubic meter per second uh, generates six megawatts uh, in average. It's a very good performance for a hydropower plant. But uh, due to problems of pollution, the uh, environmental authorities banned the, uh, this pumping except for flood control. And the result is that we have here uh, a capacity uh, of 900 megawatts, but it's operated with, with 120 because of the environmental restriction here. And one of the solutions that we, uh, we are dealing with now is to finance the depollution of this water with a raising price of the megawatt here in order to have a cross-subsidization from the electricity generation to depollution. And uh, the, uh, this is just a small example on, uh, on how I told you that we could face the problems altogether. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible. <coughs> and wouldn't be possible as well to destinate uh, pure public funds to, uh, to depollute this water. Because we are not talking only about uh, concentrated pollution. We are talking about non-point non source pollution that comes to all this, uh, this complex. And uh, it's very difficult to to control it in, uh, in a metro metropolis of this scale. <coughs> Here is uh, just a particular, uh, uh, the, uh, when you see the, the uh, here, 
I am considering at the same time five, uh, uh, five uh, hydraulic units. We, saw, uh, we say here is the Alto Tietê, the metropolitan one, and the neighbor basins. In the next slide, I am co uh, considering just the Alto Tietê, that is the metropolitan area. And here is the operational scheme and the, that reversion I told you before. And the, uh, as just to have an idea, that canal Alexander uh, referred to would be from here to there, from uh, Rio Grande to Taia Superba. And uh, <coughs> the difficulties I see uh, in executing that is um, that this is a, a very crucial area for, uh, uh, for water supply. And one of the emergency uh, uh, works we have now is a, uh, a pipeline between here and, and there, between Rio Grande and Taiasupeba. And this is pumped water under pressure. And of course, for opening it in a canal, it will, be, uh, it will have to, to suffer uh, a, 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 a very deep uh, reconsideration on its uh, project basis. You see, here is where we receive water from the, uh, from the Cantareira region. It's 33 cubic meters per second. Here is where the water, the metropolitan water is drained naturally. And here is where they drain artificially. This is an operating system. Here is a very sensitive area concerning uh, float, flash floatings. Here is also a very sensitive area. There are huge pumping stations here to control. And here is also uh, pumped uh, artificially. And here are the energetic uses, uh, the main energetic uses. Here is uh, levels, that's, uh, that's only for, uh, for the records, I will not comment on it now. Uh, I commented with Alexandre that uh, uh, there are some uh, level and volume considerations that must be taken into account when uh, uh, designing the, the hydro anel, the, the metropolitan waterways. <coughs> Another dimension I would, uh, I would raise for integration is the relationship between the metropolis and the uh, the regional waterways. The great challenge we have <coughs> is to connect this navigation in Sao Paulo with the already operating uh, uh, Tietê River waterway. This is an important waterway because all the Brazilian soya produ production in the Midwest flows through this way. And here you have an intermodal uh, uh, a station in which is embarked to the, the, to the harbor of Santos here. There is a threshold between the metropolitan region and this part that must be overcome. That is uh, a, a, a level difference, a very steep difference between uh, Sao Paulo and Salto. It's about 200 meters to be uh, uh, to be uh, 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 equation that I don't know exactly how, perhaps by a turning uh, canal or something like that. But this is the great challenge and this possibly will allow the metropolitan hydro uh, 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 waterways to be connected with the, uh, with the hinterland, uh, with, the, uh, those one, uh, with that one we see. I was fascinated by your uh, <coughs> description of the uh, eastern uh, United States hydro uh, 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 waterways, because what we see in, your, uh, in that uh, case is that the urban and local waterways and facilities um, were a consequence of a regional waterway. Uh, they, 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 they uh, the, even if there was not a very rigid uh, chronology, there was a logical uh, relationship between the regional and the local facility. In our case, 
<coughs> the great challenge is to make this connection. In green are the connections that are the most uh, important connections. In yellow, more or less, and in red, those uh, of which, from the state point of view, are not priorities. And uh, exactly uh, this canal that Alexander showed is not considered by the state a priority, but it's important to be in the whole of the architectural conception, I mean. But uh, uh, this is why I refer to different standpoints from the, uh, uh, for the academic conception, especially on a school of architecture, and the standpoint of the state public works. It's different. And we <coughs> consider this uh, segment here uh, very, very important to make possible a, uh, a future connection with the hinterland uh, waterways. As we saw before, it's meaningless to try to, uh, to connect to the coast because we have a chain of mountains that makes it impossible. Uh, so, <coughs> what I would suggest as uh, uh, conditions for scope uh, integration is to consider clearly the hierarchy of water uses. Uh, what I was commenting with the, the, the team is that um, it doesn't matter if, uh, <coughs> if the project, the, the architectural conception, considers its own parameters of, uh, of water uh, uh, quality recovery. What it must be seen is what are the standards of water quality control that are established in the, uh, in the Metropolitan uh, uh, Water Master Plan that exists and it's, uh, it's being implemented. Uh, I, I, I don't know in English the expression of the dog and the tail, but <laughs> the idea is more or less that uh, if you try in a project of navigation that's in the fourth or fifth uh, level of hierarchy to condition uh, water treatment, this is meaningless because it's like the, the, the tail uh, moving the dog, you know, it's, it's really impossible. And, and uh, the suggestion is to consider it sharing uh, and share, actually share common uh, hydraulic infrastructure. This is possible. When we, <coughs> we showed the, uh, those huge pumps on the Pinheiros rivers, those pumps, uh, uh, they, uh, they are uh, huge structures that uh, reverse something like uh, uh, 280 cubic meters per second. Beside, uh, at the side, you have a lock uh, that in which it's possible to have some sort of navigation. This must be the parameter and not the reverse. Uh, the state would never change the standards for, of pumping to allow the passage of embarkations. This is, this is not conceivable. The, 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 the reason is the reversal. Uh, the, the second point is the structural connection to the state waterways. I think this is very important. Um, and priority on segments able to immediately fulfill the preceding conditions. I mean, when we saw on the preceding uh, slide, uh, if we have to make something priority in the hydranel is this tract here, is this segment. Because this is feasible in terms of the other water use priorities. And research questions, we are in universities, we are talking about uh, collaboration between two important universities. So, uh, uh, are these questions researchable? I think they are. Uh, which combinations between water use and sharing common hydraulic infrastructure generate higher net benefits? We are not considering the net benefit of each intervention itself. We are considering the net uh, benefits of the whole of the interventions. I am considering at the same time water supply, water supply flood control, 
uh, uh, energy generation and navigation altogether because insulated their net benefits are meaningless to a, to a intervention like that. <coughs> Second, which segments of the metropolitan wa waterways are relatively more able to connect to the state network? I I've shown before. And uh, talking about the collaboration between uh, Princeton and the University of Sao Paulo, it's very interesting to have uh, selection of American experience that uh, could enlighten these uh, integrative dimensions. We, we actually had an idea on your uh, uh, intervention this morning. Uh, of course, it would be necessary to, uh, to, to go deeper in those experiences to see the exact levels and uh, the dimensions of the engineering works involved uh, uh, to, 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 to make a comparison. I suggest also to consider some very contemporary challenges in the American context, such as the, the questions uh, that are uh, uh, on the table today with California, uh, especially uh, the Southern California Water District. They have uh, uh, very recent measures taken about the uh, the water shortage that they, they are facing there. And certainly we could benefit from it. And uh, these are the, the ideas I, I would raise for my colleagues of Sao Paulo and also for the scope of the collaboration with Princeton. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so now we have the final uh, presentation. Um, okay, uh, look, I, I'm super pleased to be able to present at the conf uh, conference, and um, in some ways, uh, I wish I could have uh, Allison represent her, um, what she did as an intro to what I'll do, because it, it set the stage very nicely. So, um, so what, I'll, what I'll be talking about is actually two projects. Uh, I can almost think of them as one as a kind of before Sandy project, and the other is a kind of after Sandy project. Um, they're in the areas that... Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane. so yeah, yeah, so okay. yeah, so uh, in terms of water events in New York, it's you know it's well known. Um, the areas that, uh, that 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 I've been looking at, and really looking at it from a standpoint of a, of design and architecture, are almost a kind of speculative standpoint, which is you know what does one do uh, in these kind of uh, changing uh, contexts? Um, both of them are looking at. Uh, areas that are peripheral to the heart of New York City. They're not the downtown Manhattan, the areas that are, uh, in some cases, not as uh, focused. They're not the places that get a lot of energy uh, from politicians, but uh, we think that they're actually a kind of critical component to a larger context of the, uh, the metropolitan area. Um, and what, what, what I find particularly interesting from the standpoint of design is the question that very, very small changes in section and we're talking about storm surge as a kind of key question here, that small adjustments uh, you know, that can be measured in feet have dramatic imp influence in, uh, on plan. In other words, uh, what I'm really interested in is how s very, very close inspection of questions of section uh, can start to have um, very, very uh, 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 comprehensive um, and significant modification in plan, and how do you start to kind of look at those two uh, together? And we'll, uh, I'll look at um, that in uh, this uh, uh, condition of two projects. Uh, the first project is in, uh, in Jersey City. Uh, it was a project that was actually commissioned by the Museum of Modern Art, uh, Barry Bergdahl, uh, who many of you may know from uh, his current uh, curatorial uh, work. Uh, he, um, along with Guy Nordenson from the School of Architecture, uh, 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 kind of set in motion the possibility that uh, we would take storm surge seriously in New York Harbor, and this was done in 2010 before Sandy, uh, and the thought was to get in about five uh, firms uh, to look at uh, how one starts to take the possibility of a storm surge as a catalyst for rethinking um, the New York Harbor. Um, and so uh, the team I was working with specifically was dealing with the area of, of, of Liberty State Park. Uh, here's Manhattan. It uh, has a close proximity to Manhattan, but is otherwise kind of not part of the, 
the general day-to-day -day life or even the conceptual uh, thinking of, uh, of the city. It's a kind of uh, leftover space. In fact, uh, in some ways, many respects, is a leftover space uh, of the very industries and systems and networks uh, that Chris was talking about this morning. Um, it's best known probably for the, uh, the monuments, the Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island, the Central Railroad of New Jersey, and the, new, uh, the kind of infrastructure of New Jersey Turnpike. Um, it's currently a, um, a brownfield site. We like to regard it as a kind of invasive species botanical garden. Uh, it's, it is this, uh, it's this place that has close proximity to Manhattan, quite large. It's about the size area of Central Park, um, but it's not, not heavily trafficked. It is, uh, it is really the residue, um, or I should say it was the land produced uh, in order to handle the, uh, the railroad, uh, for bringing people from Ellis Island uh, into the rest of uh, the country. Um, so it was built over a period of about uh, 60 years, 70 years. Um, and precisely when the railroad uh, stopped having as much demand, the, the area um, uh, uh, was left less, less heavily used. And in a strange way, one can almost think that the, the landfill, the motivation or the industries that produced uh, the landfill uh, are in a sense part of the, 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 the causes of the kind of global um, uh, sea level rise that will essentially lead to this site's um, uh, inundation in a sense. So um, certain prediction levels that most of the site will be underwater. Um, uh, again, these models are actually even, even now, this is, project is about five years old and even then the, the predictions are, 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 are being rethought. Uh, but the general assumption is that the site would uh, would under just sea level rise and certainly any, any storm surge uh, would be uh, would be inundated 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 ah, that's a hard word inundated uh, and I speak English as my native you know tongue so um, so anyway, so, so one of our, our thoughts taking this on and, and really the question is what do you do what what do you do from a standpoint of design in this context how do you project a, 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 a kind of future model uh, uh, for what could take place. And so one of the things we looked at is this very simple section, the kind of typical edge of uh, Manhattan, or frankly most cities in relationship to their waterfront, is this hard edge, a kind of built edge. And our thought was that in order to even make high enough ground that could uh, sustain itself in the future, we would have to work through cut and fill. Um, and then in the process, we would actually start to look at the landscape not being a series of terraces, but actually a series of inclined planes. And in that process, be able to develop a series of a kind of fingers of, of kind of higher ground that then um, would allow a kind of cross graining uh, based on the kind of uh, development of this landscape. And the main, main purpose of that is to develop a kind of range of coastline. Um, the greater quantity of coastline had the capacity to absorb. Um, some of the energy of the storm surge, as well as produce uh, a more intricate uh, 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 kind of landscape for design. And from a uh, program standpoint, our thought would be that we would try to um, position a kind of, if you will, kind of anchor points at the end of each of these kind of fingers, um, but that as a whole, this would be a kind of new notion of a park. It would both be uh, uh, kind of productive in the sense of aquaculture, agriculture, combining also uh, leisure with uh, preservation uh, and so forth. A kind of something that would, 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 uh, would take advantage of the kind of the fact that this place would be constantly adjusting relative to uh, its section, uh, that we could develop a very different notion and even a very different figure of the, uh, of the land in the context of the harbor. Um, so that for the purposes of the exhibition, we worked with a large scale model that we projected onto so that we could animate effectively the adjustment between low tide and high tide and really see the planned consequences of these very small incremental shifts of section, but would have dramatic consequences on the landscape. And that would be part of the design. The design would embrace the fact that water would come in. And again, for the purposes of, of, of an exhibition, we went to the level of uh, fairly detailed aerial perspectives that would give a kind of sense of inhabitation. And again, rethinking how even their architecture would exist here. The, uh, the building, say for this uh, uh, agriculture, uh, sorry, aquaculture research center, the building itself would be stable and the ground would be unstable, right? The, the ground would constantly be moving up and down underneath the building, the various kelp beds and kind of testing beds, uh, and the building would, in a sense, be the kind of stable point of registration for these adjustments. Um, 
Similar, similarly, we are looking at ways to intensify the use of the harbor um, through a kind of return to issues of barges or uh, inhabitation on the water uh, so that even a kind of music uh, venue could then be uh, accessed by water as much as by land. Um, and then even looking at ways that one could start to uh, develop tidal pools as swimming pools and buildings that would start to emerge out of the landscape, recognizing those buildings would also have to emerge out and kind of provide a kind of refuge uh, in the event of, uh, uh, of, uh, of higher, uh, uh, higher level waters and storms. And thinking also of ways that the existing infrastructure of the, uh, of the train station uh, could be utilized as a greenhouse, again, a kind of a testing bed for levels of salination uh, for crops, uh, again, within close proximity to the city. And again, a lot of this was, this was um, in a sense, bringing this issue of how does one design relative to the possibility of storm surge, a storm surge that in the minds of most people, certainly in New York, uh, was in the very, very distant future. Sorry. Yeah, no, far away future, not distant future. It hadn't, you know, it was, you know and so um, although we were very cap uh, captivated by this notion of a completely different relationship between the kind of figure ground of the, of the land and the harbor, um, the show was to a certain degree kind of discounted and the argument was, you know, what, there'd be no motivation to even consider this and, and unless, for example, there was a, a hurricane that came in. And of course, the hurricane came, and all of a sudden, the, the terms radically shifted in a, in a way that um, uh, was, was, was actually quite surprising. And, and not, not, not surprisingly, this is actually the, the Hurricane Sandy inundation of our site, almost identical to what we anticipated. And of course, the site was, uh, was heavily damaged. Um, as a, as a quick aside, we got the benefit out of this of um, being asked by the Parks Department to redesign Coney Island Steeplechase Pier, which was se severely damaged by Hurricane Sandy. And this was an opportunity for my office to start to imagine how one would design an icon, not through design, but through its effects, because that's actually the interest of the Coney Island Pier. And so a lot of it was infrastructural work to um, stabilize the, uh, the pier, to make it able to withstand another storm, and then to rethink that surface through very subtle things, uh, animated handrails, uh, benches for people to sit on, uh, canopies for shade that would then cast the, the uh, identification of the city or the, the location onto the ground. Um, raised walkways at the end that would separate the fishermen from the, uh, the sightseers who could then turn around and have the view back. So, um, so we've had a very interesting relationship with the stor storm um, and uh, that's continued with uh, this uh, research project, uh, Structures of Coastal Resilience, uh, that we've been working on uh, for a little over a uh, year, year and a half now. So. Um, and this is a fairly large endeavor. We're, we're, we're kind of um, at the more concluding uh, side of things. Uh, it was organized largely by Guy Nordenson and the School of Architecture. Um, and the key, one of the key things here was to combine design um, represented by four different firms, uh, sorry, four different uh, universities, four different design teams that were located in those universities, connected with four different sites on the Atlantic coast. Um, but to connect that design work with a kind of climate and storm surge science research um, coming out of Princeton. Uh, Ning Lin, Michael Oppenheimer, Chris Little, Talia Mayo, um, and working with a GIS modeling consultant, Michael uh, Tantella. And one of the key things here was to see the design and the kind of and these uh, different types of storm modeling could start to work hand in hand and they would start to inform each other. So one of the interesting things that came out, and I, I can't go into extreme detail, it would take like, far too long, but just to give you some of the kind of highlights of what, what, what we were working with, um, is looking at um, storm prediction not from an interpolation of existing uh, hurricanes, uh, which is currently what FEMA does to set up their kind of flood maps, but they actually use uh, global circulation models and to start to run thousands of uh, possible hurricanes, which get very, give you very different data as to the probability and the predictability of storms. That combined with a very close and precise inspection as, as, as much as possible, the, the bathymetry and the topography done together, start to give you very different predictable maps about where flooding might take, plas take place. And the issue here is not to actually argue one versus the other, 
but to argue that in fact to even identify on a map where you're safe and where you're not is the flaw. Like that's the problematic issue. And what FEMA does now, so what we were doing is this is based on our modeling. This was the likely hundred year. Um, return period. This is FEMA's uh, equivalent one, and you can see that they're actually incredibly different. And that's, that's actually the really interesting thing. Um, and so one of the questions was to raise, raise the very uh, argument that one could, on one side of the street, not have insurance and on the other side have to buy insurance, that that seemed fundamentally flawed. So. Um, a lot of the work of, uh, uh, of SCR, Structure of, of Coastal Resilience, was to work with the Army Corps and to, in a sense, where the Army Corps had a limit to how much they could actually experiment, to, in a sense, be able to, uh, to uh, put on the table design ideas that went outside their standard protocols. Um, and so the work was being done in conjunction with the Army Corps' comprehensive North Atlantic study. Um, and so the teams were each looking at four different sites along the Atlantic coast. And the team I was in charge of coming out of Princeton School of Architecture was looking specifically at Atlantic City. And what we are very interested in in Atlantic City was this kind of condition you find up and down uh, New Jersey, frankly up and down uh, the Atlantic coast. Uh, but it, there's a particularly high concentration of it in the back bay areas of New Jersey. These environments that from a distance or from area, Google Earth almost look like parasites, uh, these almost kind of diseased neighborhoods that have been, you know, really is the consequence of cut and fill mapped to uh, desire for individual property. They give you these very unusual uh, reworkings of the wetlands uh, into these kind of contexts. Um, not surprising, they're, they're extremely low. They're just barely above uh, water level. Um, and so these are, these are really problematic sites. Uh, and there's a lot of them. And they tend to fall into two different types. You have the type that's the wetland fingers, which tend to be slightly uh, uh, wealthier. They tend to be vacation homes um, versus the wetland blocks, which tend to be kind of uh, lower, more lower income neighborhoods. And we, in some ways, we are more interested in looking at the wetland blocks, although recognizing that these things had a lot of similarities. Um, so in specific Atlantic City, um, the entire back bay area of Atlantic City could be regarded as one of those wetland blocks. Um, it was a, it's reconstituted wetland. It's not, this is, when we think about Atlantic City, we think about the casinos and boardwalk that's along here. That's not the area we were concentrating on. We were looking at the back bay area. Um, the area is uh, largely for working class uh, people who worked in the casinos, not the owners of the casinos themselves, and not, not the tourist areas per se. Now one argument, of course, is that one should just restore the wetland, but that's in some ways we realize is not only kind of not tenable, um, it's, it's almost kind of uh, too, uh, it, it, it ignores some of the kind of realities that are there. Um, but it, it does recognize the fact that right now, most of the flooding that's gonna take place in Atlantic City are gonna come from the Back Bay. That's actually the areas that's gonna be most vulnerable. Um, in a strange way, the casino and the kind of heart of Atlantic City, although Atlantic City right now is all, you know, that's another, the economic problems in Atlantic City and that seem to get worse and worse are another discussion, but in terms of vulnerability relative to flooding, the Back Bay area is, is uh, significantly problematic, in part because the Army Corps has really spent a lot of effort and money on the beaches, right? Um, this is where the effort has been spent to, to nourish the beaches, to build them up. Um, and it's the back area that, that is an accumulation of a really a kind of patchwork of uh, broken infrastructure, uh, no infrastructure, or simply um, uh, residues of, uh, of, uh, of failed real estate schemes, et cetera. So uh, whereas the beach, as I mentioned, is, has been, uh, lots of money have been spent on the beaches. Um, and one of the things that we, we were dealing with is the, is, the, is the problem of the kind of extruded section. So the beaches have been, been uh, fortified, but they've been fortified through extruding the exact same section design down the length. So you end up with a kind of McBeach. You know, it's a kind of formulaic beach. It's there for, uh, it doesn't, doesn't have almost, it has almost no variation in its section or in its plan as that section is extruded. Um, so this, this we found quite fascinating is that the Army Corps works through the operative section, the kind of cross section that has 
uh, has been tested, has certain validity, and that its design when it gets implemented in plan, as I mentioned, is largely about deploying and extruding it. So, um, so one of our questions is how could that be, how could that argument be rethought, particularly if you start combining um, the possibilities of what was brought up uh, of the kind of non-structural or the natural uh, and uh, nature-based features uh, that the Army Corps is recognizing is something that they, they, they need to and they want to incorporate into their resilience and into their, uh, their defense. But what the Army Corps is, is doing, even in these early stages of thinking about this, is they tend to stack these things up. They tend to take, say, a wetland uh, or a reef, and they tend to put it in section adjacent to, say, a seawall adjacent to other kind of um, defenses. So you get these things that are accumulated through alignments, again, because of the logic of that cross-section being extruded. So part of our thinking in this, uh, in this uh, exercise was to say, could you actually take um, structural approaches, nature-based, and the, the typical kind of conventional features of a city, which are often not in the jurisdiction of the, of the Army Corps, and rethink them. Could you hybridize these in different ways? And so this led to a kind of, a kind of almost a kind of forced matrix where we started imagining uh, different combinations. Could you combine a reef uh, and a breakwater? Could you combine a building and a groin in a particular way? Um, so these are quick sketches almost to force us out of the standard models of uh, uh, the way in which these, uh, these are deployed. How could they actually be hybridized uh, for different effects? In part, how could they actually uh, sponsor new models for uh, how we as architects or planners or designers uh, think in these, uh, in these contexts? Okay. Um, so moving specifically into this neighborhood, we looked, we, we decided to take on a particular neighborhood much more, uh, uh, in much more detail um, and take on the idea that uh, this neighborhood, Chelsea Heights, was really, there were two models being pre uh, presented for it that we, we found were, 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 again, both problematic. One was the argument that one simply fortifies it, and there's an Army Corps analysis out there that says for you know, eight or ten million dollars, they could fortify, you know, one third or two thirds of its perimeter in the standard seawall model. And this is, this has a lot of uh, difficulties. One, it's never going to be high enough. Um, it's, and because of that, it's susceptible to catastrophic failure if it's overtopped, as we saw in, uh, in New Orleans. Um, it tends to separate the community from the waterfront um, by, it, by the nature of that height. It requires a lot of maintenance, and ultimately it, does, it depletes the wetland and doesn't provide any ability by which the natural capacity of that ground contributes to the general absorption uh, in the event of storm surge. So it actually magnifies the problems elsewhere. Uh, similarly, the idea of retreat, that people are just going to give up their homes, they're going to walk away, or they could be bought out, uh, is also problematic. It, it, you know, needless to say, it destroys communities, you lose your tax base, it's politically incredibly difficult to do, and buyouts are costly. Um, so our question was, could you, through the agency of section, really, um, develop an amphibious suburb? In other words, could you find a way that you, you let the water to come in? Um, could you uh, allow the lawns to be reimagined or returned to a kind of state of a wetland of sorts? Um, could you think about roads and, uh, and, uh, and um, any kind of uh, barrier that provides some degree of protection as a kind of hybridized system where you get mutual benefit from these things? Um, and ultimately, could we, in the act of rethinking this neighborhood, could we actually end up with, um, in say 100 years, uh, a settlement pattern that's actually ecologically, and aesthetically, and maybe even economically uh, beneficial? Um, so that was, that, was the, that was what we kind of put on the table. Could we actually produce the amphibious suburb? Uh, the site of Chelsea Heights is one of the few mixed race neighborhoods in all of, uh, of Atlantic City. It's a really, it's a very interesting neighborhood. It is lower income. Um, and, uh, and, the, uh, and, and it's very low. So here's high tide right at the north side of the site. Uh, you can see that, you know, there's, again, there's a road here and it's barely a foot above, uh, above the uh, uh, current sea level. The community just starts right to the right. Uh, and other places you get the wetlands there and then the community is there. So it's, it's this incredible proximity uh, that takes place. Um, 
Not surprisingly, if you go up and down New Jersey now, th this is what's happening, right? So even without um, much uh, motivation from a kind of top down, um, people are elevating their houses. Granted, insurance uh, pressures are doing this, um, but there is this kind of very interesting condition where houses are being simply kind of jacked up on stilts. Uh, new houses are being built assuming this condition. And, which we found even more interesting, is properties are being built with this platform as part of the land. Like, this is being sold as the land, right? Um, this is kind of an amazing idea. So, um, and so this we found really interesting, but both from a standpoint of an architect, but also if you go back in the 20, you know, utopian models of the 20th century are all about elevating the building above the ground, the PLOT, the roof garden. Well, here it is, here's utopia, it's, it's there, it's, it's out there. And we, we actually found this super interesting. And so we started doing some analysis of, you know, I, we, drew, you know we, did, we basically drew about 20 of these buildings um, this was our surrogate lawn where because you're not, your house is disconnected from the lawn, you build your deck as a surrogate lawn. It's a big deck. It wraps around the house. Um, and one of the interesting things about these houses is the very simple question of where you put the front door is always problematic. Here's a house that got lifted and the front door is marooned on a deck. You can't even get to the front door. So um, it's kind of left there as a resi residue. And even when new houses are built, they, they just get rid of the convention of the front door. Why bother? You don't even need a front door. So, uh, but what you might need here is a, is a meter reading pulpit. So this is a set of stairs that goes up so you can read the meter and as a result, I guess, preach to the neighborhood. So um, <laughs> this is very, very strange. Um, but, the, but for us, this was, this, was, this was actually really interesting. This is happening, right? Um, but what isn't happening is, you know, is the roads aren't being lifted. So you have individual people lifting their houses, um, and they're, th that's, that's how you can continue to exist in the area. So one of our thoughts was, um, in Chelsea Heights, we have the advantage that there's, a, there's not only roads. It was, built, it was a neighborhood built in post-war, built with an excess of car culture. I think each road is four lanes wide. It has alleyways. There's too much asphalt, and so that's an advantage. So our thought was, could we, we need to find a way to get the water in um, so that we can find a way that the natural process of, of water percolating back into a neighborhood can start um, uh, allowing the wetland to um, essentially take over the yards. Um, so in a sense, if we kind of took one neighborhood, or sorry, one block within the neighborhood, the strategy over a period of time is to recognize that certain houses are going to be abandoned in the short term. Some are going to get lifted. Some may need to be bought back by, the, by a, a government organization or a private uh, investor. We know that there's going to be a kind of adjustment of the section of the individual houses. Um, but the, from the standpoint of the city, what they could do is they could start uh, looking at ways that they could start converting these alleyways, these redundant alleyways, as a means to feed the canals back into the neighborhood. Um, and that over a period of, say, 15 years, you may end up with a kind of less dense neighborhood, but the ability to now allow a kind of canal living. And in conjunction with that, that the local roads will have to start to be elevated. These roads are already getting inundated on a kind of monthly basis, high, extreme high tides. They need to, the money needs to be invested to lift the roads, but to do that in a way that still recognizes that there can be movement of water through the site. Um, and that there will need to be some consideration to the issue of the, of the boardwalk. And one of the interesting challenges on this project, because we were working with the Army Corps, we were trying to not design the houses. It was actually very hard to do this project and not design the houses, because that's what you want to do. And that's, that's what I had my studio do this past fall. I had, students work on that. Um, but so the issue of how do you get into the houses, our thought is that at least the road would be lifted somewhat so that extreme distance, say for someone in a wheelchair, could now be somewhat alleviated and the issue of the sidewalk or the connection to the house now needs to be taken on as an issue. But over a period of time, we're looking at 2050, uh, lawns are really being slowly converted by the natural process of migrating wetlands. Um, and that, in effect, one isn't seeing this as a negative thing, but in fact, uh, the idea of a kind of uh, amphibious neighborhood could take hold as a catalyst for, uh, for new investment, reinvestment uh, in this site. Um, 
And a lot of this is driven by a very simple section, right? Which is to cut, uh, cut, the, cut down the, the, this kind of, we probably need it to be wider based on um, some sketches we've seen this morning, but um, the idea that one would actually allow water to come in, you elevate the roads and the sewers associated with it, houses are gonna be lifted up, and so one ends up with a fundamentally different section for this uh, suburban neighborhood. And that that section then has the capacity with lower uh, volume uh, storm uh, or lower storm surges to really become a kind of um, each road can start to work uh, uh, collectively to mitigate some of the problems of the storm surge and to help start to provide some degree of uh, a buffer against Atlantic City uh, proper. So it becomes part of a better system um, for the whole, uh, whole, uh, whole area. Um, so taking a, um, an aerial view of the site, we modeled every single building, um, school, and so forth, and started to look more precisely at what this would mean for the whole neighborhood, um, looking for ways that you know, this is the sandy inundation that took place across the site. So could the first move be a kind of pilot phase on the north side, which is what the photograph we looked at before, to elevate the evacuation corridor, which is, is one of the um, um, projects that's on the, um, at City Hall right now but to elevate it in such a way that it becomes a berm at a certain height that's valve, that allows water to come in, and more importantly, develops a kind of wetland park so the notion of the wetland isn't seen as other, isn't seen as something that's not part of the neighborhood, but actually gets brought in and becomes part of the daily life of the neighborhood as the canals start to work their way in. This is, you know, in part, this is kind of speculating 80 years forward, so there's always kind of problems associated with that. But our, felt, our thought was that could we do this in a way that recognized that this was an incremental, an inherently incremental pro, uh, process. Um, that those elevated uh, roads would, in the event of a kind of sm uh, storm surge in 2020, actually work to, uh, to keep the neighborhood more protected, more along the lines of, uh, of a seawall um, through the floodgates. Um, so that in cross-section here, you see uh, some of the things we're, we're, we're looking at. Um, again, a kind of sequence of sections for how that road is an inhabitable berm, a kind of what we call a berm with benefits um, that, 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 that has consequences that are uh, positive for the neighborhood. Uh, at 2050, the ability to move the canals through the site um, to look at lifting the roads um, so that even in this case, and we realize that due to uh, sea level rise, the berm is not going to be sufficient in its own right, and that's fine because at this point, water can come into the neighborhood and that's not problematic. But perhaps the kind of uh, public school, which is more in the center, uh, would, would have some degree of protection through the sequence of lifted roads. Um, and then at 20, uh, 2100, the idea that one has a, 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 an amphibious suburb um, that accepts the fact that in storm surge, the entire area is, is covered in water, and that's part of its natural existence and doesn't produce a cat catastrophic uh, effect on the neighborhood. Um, so in order to kind of, in some ways what we were trying to do is use Chelsea Heights as a specific test case, um, but really the implication is that this could operate in a variety of these areas, whether it's Chelsea Heights and being able to use the alleyways, or if we're looking at uh, Wildwood, New Jersey, which doesn't have the alleyways, one would have to look at that elevation and the kind of bring in the water in as part of the system of the road itself. Um, or if you looked at the wetland finger areas, um, that this would have to be done largely f through elevated roads and recognize um, that one's gonna have a very different notion of lawn. And what, what we find intriguing about this is that on the one hand, it's, 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 it's counterintuitive in the sense that it doesn't preserve a lot of the things one associates with suburbs. You, 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 the lawn is gone as we know it. The house's relationship to the lawn is, is fundamentally different. Um, but it's not in itself, um, in, in our mind, something that's actually uh, either not gonna happen, it's gonna happen, it's already happening. The question is how do you design it in a way that it actually leads to a kind of collective uh, benefit and, and ideally something that uh, that produces in a sense a new model for uh, for coexistence uh, relative to uh, to climate change so um, that's that's it so thank you very much thank so. Um, so this is a challenge um, and a big one um, as you 
know or may not know, but in any case, in the program, it says I'm a historian. I am a historian, but I'm even a worse kind of historian than Alison is, because at least Alison deals with the 19th century on, and I don't. I'm an early modern historian. I'm going further and further into medieval uh, every day. So uh, I'm perhaps both less prepared to address the issues and in some bizarre ways more prepared to address the issues because my view is necessarily more longue durée and uh, because of the type of reading and the type of approach that I have to both history and to teaching, uh, I think quite a bit in evolutionary time in, and in geologic time in addition to historical time. And so those are the dimensions that you all provoke me to think of when you present both this morning and this afternoon. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is that I think I warned Bruno when, and Mario that when they asked me to comment that um, uh, I, you know, I'll paraphrase, but I think I did warn them that I see my role as a sort of um, devil's advocate, as an agent provocateur um, in this conversation. So. If I do do that, please don't take it personally or as an attack. I'm basically doing what I'm expected to do, I hope. So I'm struck by a number of things, um, and that uh, about both sessions. So I'll, I'll try to start with this session and then see if I can make linkages to the previous session as well. One is the issue of scale and the directionality of the motivation well, or the impulse for uh, the projects. Uh, for Sao Paulo, for the fluvial metropolis and the navigable uh, 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 met metro or macro metropolis. And the other one, um, the scale of uh, uh, that Paul presents of one site of experimentation. And what is it that is leading to that focus? And it was very interesting to notice that for Paul, it is the changes in climatic conditions uh, that transcend the neighborhood. They transcend Atlantic City. They even transcend the eastern seaboard. It's just that you happen to be on the eastern seaboard, and institutionally, that's how you coordinate the research. But it's a very macro, at the mega macro scale, inward to the neighborhood type of analysis. Um, to uh, use the neighborhood, even though it is focused on a place called Chelsea Heights within Atlantic City, uh, you are presenting the analysis as uh, a test for what would happen under conditions that are actually applying to the whole planet, but in different uh, manners. And that was interesting because in some ways it is a contrast to the earlier approach, which, is, which proceeds from the city of Sao Paulo and the urban challenges of that particular urban center outward. Um, and. Um, I, one of the things that I wondered is, what would happen? Is it possible to combine those approaches? And I think that that is part of what Ricardo was uh, um, sort of aiming at in his presentation, which is to, um, yes, consider the problems of Sao Paulo as a metropole, but also consider Sao Paulo in terms of its place in a region. Um, that and a region that is not just in Brazil, but also a region that happens to be in a system of river basins that is transnational, and that from a very earlier slide, there's also a continental dimension. Uh, but uh, so I wonder if those two approaches of the macro inward and the city outward could be. Um, uh, can be developed uh, even more. I think that Ricardo offers us a way to, uh, to do that by addressing the connection between the existing metropole and a conceptualization of a macro metropole and how that uh, affects uh, a proposal or a project for turning Sao Paulo into a fluvial city. Um, I see a, a number of um, uh, of other dynamics here at play. One is that uh, in, in Paul Lewis's proposal, I see an assumption of, um, and let me see my notes. There's an assumption of, um, hold on, where did I put this? There's an assumption that the settlement patterns will change. 
there's an assumption that the manners, manner in which humans inhabit their urban settings and what an urban setting even is, is subject to change. It is, to make a very bad pun, fluid. Ha ha ha. Because, <laughs> because of the ebbs and flows of storm surges and climatic change and flooding and so on and so forth. Uh, and I am curious with regards to the Hidranel uh, in relationship to Sao Paulo. I wasn't quite clear because this would require that I, I mean, based on the presentations alone, my assumption is that, or, or my understanding is that it's the opposite assumption. The assumption is that Sao Paulo remains set, the, the, Sao Paulo is a permanent thing and it will acquire Nidranel and everything, but that the settlement pattern will be what it is, uh, with a fluvial dimension to it that nonetheless won't crisscross the entire urban space. It'll go around it, and uh, in the last phase of the third canal, it will cross through, but it's not gonna crisscross as in the sort of uh, water fill model that uh, Paul was, was talking about. So I think that that's another uh, contrast that I'm seeing, which is what is assumed to be the constant. And in the, in the, in, in the Sao Paulo as fluvial metropolis, uh, uh, the constant is Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo remains and the urban uh, settlement pattern remains. That's based on the presentations. I would have to go and look at the material that you actually have online to see whether that understanding is correct or not, and it very likely is not but I thought that there was an interesting um, contrast. And I think that there are implications to that contrast. Um, uh, I mean, as a historian, and as a historian that has looked at the fate of cities over long periods of time, and for whom nothing really about human history or human settlement or human society is sacrosanct, I happen to not have tremendous love for civilization, um, sorry, uh, I mean, and that's probably the reason why um, I find processing this a little bit hard because it is very urban centric, very rooted in civilization, very defensive of civilization. Um, I told you I thought it evolutionary and geologic time, that's, that's where it comes in. Uh, but the, the, what I mean is that one, I studied the, the my book, first book is, and I, I'm not meaning to say propaganda here, but I, I, the, my first book is about the desiccation of the lakes that used to surround the city of Mexico, which was undertaken by the Hispanic elites and the, um, the, and the crown in order to save the city from floods. At the expense, of course, of everybody else for whom the floods were a requirement of life and without whom which they could not possibly survive, which meant all the hinterland populations and even urban populations for whom the seasonal flooding was a fact of life and a necessity of life. Um, and what is interesting is that in the very first debates about what to do about the problem of flooding, the unexpected problem of flooding for the Spanish crown and the Hispanic elites, that the crown said, well, why don't you just move the city? abandon the site and take off. Put it here, See, that's higher ground. Just put it there, no problem. And there was massive resistance from those people that had already invested a lot of capital, built capital, a form of treasuring in that city. So it makes me wonder whether those, there are similar dynamics going on here because my question actually, when I see the problems that you have in Sao Paulo, and compare them to these types of problems and the sort of true. We're dealing here with a neighborhood in a city that is not a mega city. Atlantic City is you know, not, not the same challenges as Sao Paulo. So I wonder here, well, if you applied your logic to some a mega macro metropolis on a coastline, how easily could this be, uh, could this happen? I mean, apply it maybe to Venice, I don't know, and, and we'll see. Uh, or to the Netherlands, to the entire stretch of the Netherlands, and, and we'll see. Um, but the, the, the question that immediately popped into my head from a historical perspective is, well, why not let Sao Paulo be with all of its limitations and with its challenges? Forget the Hidranel, move on. Uh, <laughs> I know that that sounds like a rather, um, and you know, uh, 
destructive proposal, but from a historical perspective, it's something that's been done before. In civilizations, cities are abandoned. And they're not just abandoned, and I'm not saying abandoned Sao Paulo, I mean, um, uh, I was in a conversation in Mexico City, uh, the Colegio Nacional, about this very same problem. Another mega city, uh, which is way more enclosed and has other challenges that Sao Paulo do doesn't have, and which operates as a, as a hydrological octopus in a way that is not that dissimilar from what you're talking about Sao Paulo, except that we don't have the differences that you were talking about in level, and that the challenges of transporting the water to the basin of Mexico do depend on pumping, but nonetheless. But you're talking about rather similar dynamics of Sao Paulo extending its tentacles way into its hinterland for water resources, as well as for the projection of its interests through a fluvial system that may or may not coincide with the state priorities, with the regional priorities, with the international priorities of the basin management and the continental priorities. So the Mexicans, uh, propose, one of the things that they proposed was, okay, let's not abandon Mexico City, but let's stop allowing it to continue to grow. So I think that part of the difficulty here is also the growth imperative. So um, because we are so locked into a developmentalist and growth imperative, it becomes very difficult to think of cities as remaining stagnant. Just let them be and do not assume the necessity of growth. In Mexico, the way that they were proposing the discussion was, well, let's decentralize the functions of the city. N not in the way that you did with Brasil, that was done with Brasil, but sort of in the productive as aspect of the city, to uh, export those to other places and therefore provide other magnets for migration that would not be the city of Mexico and that therefore would provide less of a pressure on the water table uh, because the fundamental problem nowadays in Mexico City is that, it's water. In a different way from here, from Sao Paulo, but still, it's un recurso hídrico with the same hierarchy of consumption that Ricardo was talking about or the same hierarchy of priority of use that Ricardo was talking about. And so they confronted that problem with that proposal, which is, um, Leave the city alone. Don't do anything to it. Just disperse the things that happen in that place elsewhere in order to uh, interrupt the octopus effect of the city on the hydrologic basins outside of its reach, as well as the social and economic and political implications of that projection, which means that everything is from Mexico City in and that I, I wonder, it makes me wonder whether, are we looking at the same model through this Hidroanel at Sao Paulo? Is it one where Sao Paulo projects its interests regionally and then draws them in? Um, or is it a more integrated approach? So those, those are some of the observations that I have. And then, then also thinking historically, I am struck by the comparisons with, by the uses of history. That, uh, uh, that Alison was talking about earlier um, when she commented on the first panel, whose comments I found brilliant, um, as well as the panel. Uh, but uh, in, when I think about the examples you gave, the Canal du Midi, uh, Languedoc, uh, um, the, um, uh, la, you know, the ones in Paris with the Calan de Sarmentin, La Villette, uh, Chicago, uh, in the, not today, but at other times, you have mentioned Tenochtitlan. Um, all of those things were contingent on extremely powerful and centralizing states. And those mega canal projects, those big think engineering projects of the Renaissance on, and in the case of Tenochtitlan even earlier, were state projects that Ex that basically served for the colonization of the hinterland for the interests of those people who presided that state. So I wonder, it makes me wonder about the dynamics of this, whether are we seeing a similar dynamic, especially because I'm not quite getting clear who exactly is the agent of either what Paul Lewis is proposing or the Hidroanel. Is it the state? Is it private firms? Is it a combination thereof? Um, and some of the quintessential questions a historian asks is who, for whom, for whose benefit, at whose expense, 
or at what's expense? And in the, when we ask those questions, we often mean something very specific. If you answer those questions from a class perspective, then you will have to answer, uh, well, at the expense of the peasantry, or at the expense of uh, the working class, or for the benefit of the profit-making real estate uh, speculators, as happened with the final push for desiccation in Mexico. That was the drive, real estate speculation, the humongous value of land. That's what pushed the completion of that desiccation project. Um, so uh, that, so the state, uh, you know, that, there's, that, there's the dimension that the, these mega projects in the past, in, the, in uh, early modernity and before, are contingent on a state pushing them through precisely because they, they, they assume a control of the territory that no other entity can undertake. Uh, but it also it implies a process of colonization. Languedoc was colonized by Paris. It wasn't, you know, oh, incorporated into France because it, it belonged to France. No, it didn't. Ask the people there if they thought they were French. No, they didn't. So it was colonized. And so the state doing these mega projects uh, through canals, through massive re-engineering of landscapes, in historical terms, you could really understand them as processes of colonization. So I wonder whether that is valid or not for the modern period that you two are talking about. And if it is, then who exactly is doing the colonizing? Is it some sort of... Um, uh, disinterested and impartial state, or are they social groups that operate through the state for their own benefit or their own profit? Um, that that's, makes me uh, think uh, about that. Um, then, uh, so I have a lot of more, but I think I might um, just, uh, I, this morning I had asked the issue of financing. And that goes for both of the presentation this afternoon, and it also goes for the presentations this morning. Um, where's the money coming from, all of this? I mean, Ricardo, you were talking about, well, we're doing this in the middle of a huge fiscal crisis. So these projects involve tons of investment. And both the, I mean, if we were to push your project at a bigger scale than a neighborhood, it's pretty significant. Um, and you were thinking, you were saying, well, yes, the U.S. Army Corps, well, that's a state, uh, but also you were talking about firms being, so what is it going to be, a hybrid of firms and state? Um, if it is the state, then that, that raises immediately the question of, well, how will the state do this? Will, they, this? will this be going back to the methods of mass public indebtment that led, that was typical of the pharaonic projects of the 1960s? Uh, or is this going to be mm, something else? Will this be by inviting Chinese capital? I don't know. Uh, but I, I'm very curious because all of these enterprises take significant amounts of investment that um, we're not talking about petrodollars anymore, but maybe we're talking about something else. And that intrigues me. Um, and it intrigues me in connection with the earlier question that I had asked about public and the degree of control. Who controls, who decides, who runs things. If it's state monies, then by definition there is a greater degree of control. But if it's private monies, or if it's international monies, then we're talking about something different. Um, and all of these things have implications in, in, my, uh, in my view. Um, so, uh, I, get, I realize I'm not really asking questions, but more tossing out thoughts, and perhaps that's okay. Um, and uh, one of the, well, I was really struck by one of the research questions of Ricardo uh, about, um, you were asking to what extent we could um, use, um, let me go back to them, you had three research questions. Um, uh, which combination of water use, well, you, I won't repeat them, but at the la last question you said, which American experience could, it, could enlighten these integrative dimensions that you had analyzed? And I was going to say, well, um, because of all that ju I just said, I don't think um, the American experience alone is enough, quite frankly. And it isn't enough because the, these massive interventions on landscapes do not play out 
and have their effects in decades or even in short centuries. So the American experience is, I'm afraid, too short, the North American experience, to provide an experiment, a historical experimental ground for what you can get when you intervene on such a scale on human populations and um, human ecological landscapes, on, on built or unbuilt uh, landscapes um, at such a scale. So I think it's more appropriate to think of um, broader historical time and even more so when, because we're talking about modifying geo-hydrological processes that uh, whose effects take a long time to show up. I mean, now we're seeing what the effects of the desiccation were in the basin of Mexico. But it's not even the beginning of the effects. It's just the tip. So um, I think that the um, experiences, in terms of you invited two historians to comment, um, it makes me puzzled about the extent to which a uh, historian's voice would work in these questions and research. Uh, are we here to provide background, or are we here to provoke? Uh, are we here to point historical problems, and you then will say, yeah, that's very interesting. OK, let's moving on. Um, so I'm very curious about what the role of the historians is in this process of discussion of very regionalized uh, problems of a, of a of, uh, recrafting of an entire city and its relationship with its hydro hinterland um, here. Um, but from the third question that you asked, my impression is that the role of a historian would be to really try to bring in um, the historical experimental ground that you cannot possibly repeat. You can't do an experiment on existing populations, but you can use historical experience to determine what are the possible outcomes um, for different kinds of interventions. Um, and then, yeah, I'll just, I'm, I'm going to shut up, uh, but I think that there are many themes that we could uh, discuss that uh, were left over from the last panel that we didn't really get into in great detail, but that were very fruitful. There's also the question of obsolescence. So what time frame into the, into the future are we projecting our period's priorities? I mean, everything you put in the landscape is going to last a long time, and it's going to legate to future generations our understandings and our priorities. So um, how are we thinking about the obsolescence of our own perspectives? <laughs> Uh, projected into the future. Um, then um, I'm, I'm also wondering about this issue of land values uh, that we are, have, was addressed sort of tangentially by Ricardo, and I don't remember very much if uh, Paul was doing that. But in the case of Mexico, the whole process of desiccation was linked to speculation, land mm. value speculation. And a lot of the New York filling in of the water lots that was not just commercial, but real estate speculation. The uh, 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 just read Ted Steinberg, <laughs> um, Gotham Unbound, and that's what it is. So I wonder, is that there somewhere? And mm, how how does the project? How do these projects contemplate that factor that will intervene sooner or later? Uh, um, then for the specific project in Sao Paulo, I was very struck by the role of garbage and the need to move garbage. And so I wondered, why is the focus garbage in terms of, why is the prime thing the garbage? Um, that was sort of uh, puzzling. Earlier I had raised the question of decision making. We're talking about mega transformations of landscapes that have humans in them for the long term. Who makes the decisions and how? Um, about these things. Um, so those are some of, of the questions, and perhaps I might reiterate some of um, um, uh, some of Alison's this morning because I think that she was brilliant. Uh, not to flatter my own colleagues, but she just happens to be brilliant. Um, so, uh, and then the, 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 she had, had her last point was the issue of technology. Um, and it's Paul's uh, sort of images 
bring that to mind a lot with people doing their own domestic elevations of, uh, of it, it reminds me that technology, just because you introduce a new technology, the old technologies don't go away. Everything continues in use. And it's a question of figuring out, well, how exactly do they, like, do they uh, interact and do, they, are, are, do we design that inter interact? I'm not a designer, but I would imagine that that would be a prime problem for a design at this scale. And Ricardo was kind of addressing that when he talked about using existing infrastructures that are already uh, sort of acquiescent acquiescing to the water use priorities that there are that are embedded in, that are the, the logic embedded in current technological uh, systems um, so the technological dimensions of what persists and what is innovated and how do you design and can you even design the overlap between all of those when there it, when a lot of the people that are do that are doing the coexistence are like the homeowners that just raise their own houses. You can't, there's a level of control at which it's difficult to penetrate. Um, and then the question of the, of the technology brings me to an additional question, which is the issue of reversibility. You're talking about water fill as opposed to landfill, and we're talking about reverting to pre-existing conditions. I mean, in New York, that will be basically letting New York go back to what it was, uh, sort of in a, in terms of where the where how far the water went, so all of these technological interventions. Do you, when you're considering the issue of design, consider reversibility, or is that not a function of design? And if it isn't a function of design, given the drastically changing climatic ecological conditions, shouldn't it be a factor of design to introduce reversibility into? systems like this that are so transformative and so radically transformative? I'll leave it there. So, um, uh, your chair. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Vera. I think you gave us uh, material, enough material to work for the next 15 minutes, of course. <laughs> we only have uh, I would minutes. like to, well, we're supposed to go for five minutes. So, um, but of course, we can always, like, I was flexible. <laughs> I could be flexible again in the afternoon. Yeah. But I would like to set up some rules so um, and some priorities so everybody has the chance to express their questions or respond to questions. So I would ask, uh, I would, my request is that let's not have lectures now, but uh, brief responses and, uh, and, uh, and I would suggest that we start with Ricardo and Paul, who gave their presentations this afternoon. And then um, I know that Alexandra is definitely anxious to uh, respond to your <laughs> critique and defend the possibility of an Israel, which you just demolished. I did not. <laughs> no, I'm exaggerating. So, so Ricardo. Well, thank you. Um, I, I think I, I wouldn't be able to answer or to point about all the, the, the questions and raised in the first time. Uh, in the first place, I am not an expert on, uh, on, on, the, on some of the issues you raised. And second, it would require another day to consider all these dimensions. However, I would like to to point some of that. Um, as I told you, I, uh, I have a double insertion in this process, part as an academic and a senior professor is the designation in Brazil for, for a retired old man that I still uh, bother the university with some, uh, with, uh, some postgraduate supervision. But my main uh, professional concern is as a public officer in the State Secretariat of Energy. And we are, uh, until the uh, last year, was uh, uh, also managing the water crisis for the urban supply. And um, as public officers, we are supposed to offer immediate answers to immediate problems. Uh, we are talking about 
uh, urban concentration of 20 million people and a, uh, a regional, uh, next regional concentration of about 32 million people. So if we, do not, if we do not give a proper answer to water shortage or energy shortage or float uh, that uh, blocks all the traffic uh, and uh, you have also the problem of, uh, of human lives involved in it. If we do not offer proper answers, uh, we give rise to very, very serious problems of uh, 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 with uh, un unbearable social uh, implications. So we are, first of all, pragmatic. We must offer proper answers to the problems. And um, when when we design strategic solutions for the for the medium and long terms, uh, we always think about the connection <coughs> of two of three uh, basic uh, conditions to keep more or less balanced the social and economic development, which are water, energy, and logistics, all together. Uh, when we talk about the uh, relationships between Metropolitan Sao Paulo and the rest of Brazil, we are talking about very crucial logistics. Uh, we are talking about uh, an, an economic movement of all the Brazilian production of soya, of uh, animal protein, and uh, other commodities that uh, that respond for most of the national GNP. So we are talking about some uh, dimensions which are crucial to keep the, uh, the economic balance of the, uh, of the country as a whole. This is not because we, we wished or we made any, any sort of choice on that. Uh, the location, this particular location of Sao Paulo City has always been strategic since the 1500s when the, the colonization started in Brazil. Because uh, the rivers uh, and uh, those connections to the, uh, to the west uh, made possible the uh, the entry of the uh, Portuguese colonizers to the hinterland, up to, as Alexander mentioned, up to the, the Pacific shore, uh, through Peru and, uh, and uh, today Peru and, uh, and, uh, and Chile. So uh, we, we are talking about a very uh, strategic location that has historic roots uh, in the very young uh, history of the of, of my country. I'm not talking about uh, a country with uh, thousands of years, uh, like China or, or India. I'm talking about a country uh, with a recent history of uh, uh, about uh, 500 years. And uh, and when you look at the the urban scale, changes are still much quicker than that. Uh, until the ending of the 19th century, Sao Paulo had a population, uh, uh, until the third quarter of the 19th century, the population of Sao Paulo metropolis was about 30,000 people. And it remained like that since the 1700s. I, I mean, in uh, about 200 years, it didn't change. But uh, when uh, the, uh, we passed from the 19th to the, the 20th century. Uh, this population raised to about 240,000 people. It means that it uh, was multiplied by uh, by eight, more or less. And from the beginning of the 20th century to now, we have this explosion to 20 million people. On the other hand. Um, we are talking about 20 million people from the last 10 years, more or less. Uh, the, uh, the population growth is stationary. Uh, since the 1980s, the, uh, uh, the growth rates are decreasing. So this gives us some, uh, uh, 
some comfort to deal with medium-term crises. In one way or another, the process of uh, letting go of decentralizing is already happening. When I showed the, uh, the macro metropolitan area, uh, there are there uh, three other metropolitan regions included. But they are not as huge as Sao Paulo. They are medium-sized metropolitan regions of about uh, one to two million people. So we are uh, now facing uh, a more or less stable process of development. This is the reality we have to deal with now. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we, uh, I think we, we couldn't uh, base our decisions on the long-term historical processes because uh, this wouldn't be practical for answering the demands we have to fulfill today. You asked them for whose benefit and at whose expense. Um, it's uh, it's well known that Brazil is one of the most uh, unfair countries in terms of uh, social distribution of uh, of wealth. This is that's for sure. In spite of that, if we do not promote uh, economic growth. Uh, we certainly will uh, create uh, an unbearable social explosion. Uh, that it's better to keep growing, regardless the uh, the, the social unbalance, than to promote any sort of uh, of economic freezing, whose co social costs would be immediate and. Unbearable. So explosion is unbearable. Yeah. Yeah. The consequences. I'm talking about people, real people who, who couldn't uh, survive to that. So our responsibility as uh, public agents is uh, is beyond uh, uh, idealized uh, uh, standards of uh, income distribution. We must keep. The, the, the aging working. Anyway, this is what I have to say on, on these general questions. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean it, look, it, one of the things that I find fascinating is the Chelsea Heights, Sao Paulo, I, uh, you know, his, you know <laughs> so it, you know, I can't say anything, and, and you know, by way of comparison, uh, but by way of comparison, no, I, I think the issue of the, um, the, the, you know, the, who's funding this and the role of the state or the federal government, I mean, look, the, this was a, um, the work we did was uh, funded by Rockefeller Foundation, which has its own kind of association, NGO, and it was specifically to look at alternative models um, to start to bias how the U.S. Army Corps functions. So there's no question where the agency is, but our role was really a kind of tweaking issue or, or torquing really of, of that. And, and the reason for that is what you have now in place is this kind of vicious cycle where the Army Corps will only reinforce seawalls or build beaches when they can actually prove that what they're building has a cost-benefit analysis. Not surprisingly, they rebuild beaches for wealthy people's houses. That makes those areas to build on more valuable. The costs go up, they can now justify building the beaches again, and it's the, it just keeps looping. The flip side of that, of course, is you take places like Chelsea Heights, low-income neighborhoods, and not only is the valuation of their neighborhood sufficiently low that it can't fund the seawall, but also their, the models, what, they're, what the people in those neighborhoods then clamor for are to preserve a kind of status quo of what they already know. And so what we were trying to do is come in and change the conversation and change the way in which that was approached. And part of that was to say that in fact, the, the, the notion of the, the seawall as the only means to then protect the lawn needs to be replaced by a different model. 
and a model that can have economic advantage for the very people who stay in that area. But it means changing the conception of what your neighborhood is. It's not lawns, front yards, stoops, et cetera. It's a very different architectural and urban environment. And our role in some ways to start to produce some visualization that would imagine this as a viable future. Um, and therefore, and this is the other argument, is to then also modify how the Army Corps goes about, and the, frankly how the state of New Jersey goes about deploying the relatively small amount of money they're gonna do. They don't build a crappy metal sea wall that's, only, that's not gonna do very much, but they might invest strategically in raising roads, which that could, they could draw from the funds of uh, the, DO, exactly. the Department of Transportation. And, that's, and what's interesting is when we first made the, we proposed it to the New Jersey government, um, and the first reaction was, yeah, okay, interesting, this is, you know, we don't consider projects like this, we didn't hear anything. They came back to us six months later and said, we're in a real bind, we don't know what to do, what you propose is actually the way we think we should move forward. And now they've, they're actually looking at this as a model for how they're gonna potentially deal with these neighborhoods because there is a national grant available for national resiliency. So this is, so there's no question that this is, what this is doing is, is working with state money. The issue though, and this is for us was super important, is that it was done in a way that ultimately has the possibility of increasing the value of the land of the very people who are there and finding ways to encourage investment in that neighborhood that now is not possible in the cycles of evaluation and funding that the Army Corps goes through. So, okay. Very good. Uh, you know, you have a very brief yeah. comment and then addition. Yeah. And it's a, it's a question, uh, a concrete question for the guy, but it sort of uh, starts with a comment on, on Paul's uh, presentation, which is self-evident for the majority of architects in the room, but not always self-evident for policymakers, social scientists, economists, the extent to which I mean, you show us all the ways in which form matters, right? I mean, not all growth looks the same, right? Uh, we need to think of morphology when we think of how cities continue to develop, uh, because partly this, this sort of very tempting model of thinking of political representation decentralizing doesn't really have uh, an analogy when we think of infrastructure. I mean, decentralizing infrastructure can have, uh, frankly, catastrophic environmental consequences, right? Like sprawl. A lot more, right, like sprawl. I mean, water systems can be a lot less efficient when we, you know, horizontally than we think they are vertically, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Which leads me to, to a question for Ricard, because um, uh, you're, you're, there was a map you showed which does consider uh, spatial variables, but at a very broad scale. And that's the one that had uh, Sao Paulo's water demand is 432%, I think, higher than the availability, uh, which, of course, tells us something about the population differences between the areas that you showed us, but it doesn't tell us that to the level of sort of individuals. So if we were actually to break those numbers down to the individual level, would it then show us that Sao Paulo is, in fact, more efficient uh, than surrounding areas which have an oversupply of water? Right, when we think of the embeddedness of energy and, and how water gets to sort of individual households. Um, and then my other question was about the, the, the hierarchy of water uses and how we have to think of the Adranel taking that into account. I mean, it's a hierarchy that makes perfect sense that navigation would be at the bottom. But what if we thought of, or is it possible you think, and this is a question for all of you, to sort of instead of, 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 of framing it as navigation, framing it as mobility, to then thinking this not only in the context of the water crisis, but of the public transportation and the mobility crisis. Right? Does this then leave more political room for this to be conceived as a viable uh, project? Starting for the second question, that's for sure, yeah. Uh, when uh, in the project, uh, multimodal project, I asked the uh, the waterways, uh, cost-benefit analysis must be done mm. both regarding the, the water uh, systems and the multiple, uh, the multi-use of waters, and the alternative alternative transport modes. Uh, when I refer to the, uh, the the state waterways, not not the metropolitan, but the, the, the wider ones, um, I. 
the, the main question involved there is an economic equation comparing different modes of transport and logistics. Um, the uh, 1914, the, sorry, the 2014 drought uh, last year uh, implied uh, raising cost of transport by uh, nearly 40 percent for transporting the commodities coming from the Brazilian Midwest because we had to, to change the, the mode. Uh, instead of coming by waterways, it came by uh, large lorries moved by diesel. So it's, uh, uh, the cost immediately reflected on the final cost of transport. And uh, regarding your first question, um, I wouldn't say that the, uh, the, the individual consumption standards in Sao Paulo metropolitan region are necessarily more efficient than the, the neighbors. But in reality, they, uh, uh, they are less. Uh, I mean, uh, the average consumption for an uh, inhabitant in metropolitan Sao Paulo is about uh, 150 liters per person per day. When compared, for instance, to Rio de Janeiro, where uh, this, this figure raises to 200 to 110 uh, uh, liters per person per day, we would say, well, Sao Paulo is more efficient. Uh, is that, uh, uh, there is, a, in your question, there is a dimension that I would like to complete something that was raised by Vera. That is, uh, who is paying, where is the money coming from? Um, we are talking about public services and public prices, which are uh, very heavily regulated. The, these prices are, are under very strict regulatory control. And what we foresee for the next, uh, the, the next cycle on the supply of public utilities in Brazil is that there will be a dramatic raising of these prices. Mm -hmm. Because um, when we talk about water security, we are talking about doubling the, uh, uh, the, the facilities for our supply without doubling the actual demand. The demand remains the same. So the, the cost involved in producing this extra water for security is uh, uh, will have to be translated into the, the water price. Yeah. The same is applied to energy. This this has uh, <coughs> uh, let's say some very undesirable social implication. On the other hand, it uh, it really pushes efficient systems of, uh, of water and energy usage. Because um, you do not need so much water and so much energy for the daily uh, activities of a family. We, we have very inefficient uh, appliances, generally speaking. And uh, when you compare, for instance, for, with uh, cell phones, with uh, individual communication, um, Nobody cares about paying, even for a low-income family, uh, a very high amount of money for uh, to keep uh, his or her uh, mobile phone. When you compare the bill of a mobile phone with the water or electricity bill, it's uh, you may say that it's two, three, or four times the water or electricity bill. So uh, why? shouldn't we change this uh, relationship, uh, considering that those other services are really uh, essential and are really costly. And they will cost more in a huge metropolitan concentration than in a medium-sized city. There is a cost to live in, the, in, a, in a metropolis. And this cost must be paid. And uh, I think this is the equation, and perhaps this pushes the natural decentralization and the, uh, the natural moving away of the people that could do it. Um, 
So well, I, I, I promise. Well, I also wanted uh, to ask uh, Christina and Angelo for comments. Uh, <laughs> that is, I don't want to uh, I was, just I was thinking. be observers, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I'm questions. sure that you definitely have uh, things to say. So, uh, so you're saying, Alexander, you defer to so the answer, I repeat the same. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, well, I would like to say that I really enjoyed the day. I, I enjoyed a lot of presentations. I mean, the, the, the morning, the afternoon session, very nice to, to learn to listen about the uh, historical approach or more uh, the current one. So then I think that is add a lot to what we are thinking of or trying to improve our understanding uh, about the proposal uh, that we brought here to be discussed. That this is the idea. And uh, different opinion about, and of course that, uh, like your question, let me consider thought ways. You know, that we are, and, and it makes sense, for instance, to think about the cost of what we are intending to do, or, but in this case. It, I think that it would be very interesting also to ask would, would be the cost to not do anything? Mm -hmm. uh, so that I, I, I'm sure it would be incredibly uh, higher than to do. And uh, so I, 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 I was thinking about to... Uh -huh. For whom? For whom? What's the cost? <laughs> I uh, no, I, 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 I won't be able to reply, but I, I would say it's funny, it's a kind of feeling, you know, it's like when you are about to change the state, you know. We are, if I say in degree, in Celsius degree, we, it is like if we had all of the water, in 99 uh, degrees, Celsius degrees. And so, if we keep going, just one more degree is nothing, but we are going to lose everything. So, it's this kind of situation. So, you talked about colonization, but this is what we are living uh, since the beginning. You know. Of course, the, the kind of disaster, no, are you from Argentina? Are you so you know what I, I'm talking about? It's something that... Thank you. We learned uh, very, so this is uh, some kind of, we, we have no, like, have no choice. Uh, but, and I think that the, the proposal, and this is, to me, is very important, uh, the proposal uh, that Alexander brought, uh, I, I'm always uh, very, uh, like, uh, we talk sometimes, no, I, I, I wouldn't like to have this road uh, misunderstood as a kind of uh, mega project or a, a huge road. And, and my feeling, and I would like to to communicate it much better, is that this project is not uh, is much more something that is being revealed, that is being uncovered. I, I, I would say literally uncovered, because most part of the rivers we have in Sao Paulo were covered. Mm -hmm. So it's much more an archaeology. Mm -hmm. It's much more just showing than to build. There is no construction. The rivers were there. It's not being posted. It's just the geography that we. And your story. Restoration of geography. 
in a way, I, I think it's pretty much like this. So, but uh, when it, it is shown, it could be <coughs> taken as a, a mega project or something like that. And I, I, I don't feel like this. I think that is a very delicate approach. It's like much more a way to show what we were not trained to see.
uh, people because in my book, uh, New Jersey is a city. Okay. And that is, it's basically, it's basically denser, denser than as a, as a territory than any other state in America, than Holland, than Japan. And you could say it's, I mean, it doesn't sound possible, but that's what it is. So in a way, I see what uh, Paul is doing is taking a biopsy into the body of this other type of CD that we know is totally unsustainable as a model. While in fact, Sao Paulo, with its density, with all the problems that that extreme density brings, at least in some areas of Sao Paulo, seems to me a lot more sustainable than the entire state of New Jersey. So, um, so that's you know that's also a, a, a question that perhaps should be considered. And that's so, Christina. I don't know if uh, you want to Just give us. No, no. I was only thinking about that. The the project is going very well, and we have a, <laughs> a good. Sorry, be, yes. No. No. It's, it's for us. It's very important to be here and to present the project of Alexandri and our team is working. And you, uh, as you see, it's an academic, but it's also uh, the possibility of thinking about a uh, new policy for not only Sao Paulo, but for the region. As Ricardo showed us, we have a lot of problems now, and I think that it's a, a responsibility of our university. It's a public university. And we have to deal with the problem. And we have to deal in, the, in both ways. And then uh, coming here and uh, hearing the, the, the magnificent uh, ex exposition of uh, Chris and also the project that you show us. It's, it's a way of thinking about what we have to deal. And uh, as I was saying to Mario first, we have to, this is a three year project. So we have to have the possibility of talking about, but have the, but taking with us the, uh, all the, explanations or the debates for the next step that we are having this year. This is, I think this is a very important yeah. issue we have to do, we have to have in this project. I think it, thank you, Mario well, and Bruno. No, thank you actually for coming. I also uh, wanted to answer very briefly the question that Vera uh, asked. Uh, I don't think it was just a rhetorical question, like uh, when you asked, uh, what am I doing here as a historian? And I think it's really perhaps uh, one of the most important questions for this project, because as I said very briefly in my uh, three second introduction, uh, what we consider this, at least from the Princeton side, an interdisciplinary project. And we feel that uh, uh, what's really important and what Princeton can offer is this dialogue where we come from very different ends and very different points of view. And uh, we, I think that that brings an element, a, a different element, because you might, I mean, it's, uh, that is, we're playing with, uh, with chat. Uh, you yeah. might come, mm, we're playing with chat. We're playing with questions that we usually don't ask ourselves. And some of those questions might force us to answer and to rethink uh, our own positions because in a way the dialogue uh, within architecture and uh, within architecture and engineering is always bouncing the same, you know, the same set of issues. And uh, for instance, having a historian and bringing the long durée, the long, obviously it's crucial for the type of issues that we're discussing here, for the, I mean, the mega 
in, tempor in the temporal axis it should correspond to the mega in the spatial axis, which is over the way here. And uh, you know, I, I think that there is definitely a, a, a very important role for the humanities and the social sciences in projects that were exclusively seen as technological projects or, you know, let's say, uh, <coughs> you know, building projects. And I think we are having now, for instance, the, this experience exactly now, co-teaching the course and our students are, I mean, we had a rotating group of students because they have classes, <coughs> but uh, it's, I think we're both learning from, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, pick up Sorry. from there. Yeah. No, and try to weave in some of the themes we've been discussing, sort of back to some of the stuff that have brought up, and then the two uh, very different case studies of the afternoon session. Um, so my way of comparison has established all the ways in which these are very incomparable um, projects. I think if we want to hold on to the, you know, the, we all agree, archaic uh, categories of civilization nature, we really can and should think of these as decivilizing projects, right, to the extent that they soften the boundaries between built environment and natural systems, right? So obviously they're not conceived in these, uh, in, within these categories in mind, but, right, if, 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 if we are to be, a, 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 you know, crusaders against civilization, I think that we have allies in, 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 in the room. And um, something <laughs> <I'll mention. laughs> I wrote down, uh, before you said that I showed to Paul to prove uh, <laughs> that I also wrote down uh, when the question of cost came up, the cost of not doing anything, right? which is applicable in the case of Sao Paulo, which is the cost of, you know, takes you three hours to get to work in the morning, you have sewage running down your house, it's very applicable in the case of New Jersey as well. Right? There's a huge cost to not do <coughs> basically leaving, letting these neighborhoods uh, be. And I think Partly what, at least to me, the interest in having these stories in the room is uh, basically what you have, you know, done, what Alison did with Christine, just in, enlarge the limits of the thinkable, right? So sort of the default mode in these discussions is often, is this viable and considering right. it in a very, very small temporal uh, scale? And <coughs> looking back not that long ago in a geological or environmental scale, we are frequently <coughs> all the time confronted with the impossible happening, right? Uh, if before the period Chris began with, anyone had predicted what <coughs> did happen 30, 40, 50, 100 years later, they would have been laughed off of any room they might have been in. Right? So we, I think we need to sort of recuperate these, this enlarged sense of the thinkable and possible because the crisis we are in. Yes. Boston, that considered the floating city or 
para fita, assim, tipo, piro, de mim, piro, assim, assim. Em Brasil, em Brasil, na Amazônica, em Redes, é de several kinds of floating houses and flat cities, covered by shadow, shadow, shadow for trees, né? flooding trees, né? forest, sorry. It is uh, instilling our imaginary. Stimulate our imagination. Then, bring it to this, this table, the historic, historic dimension. Remember for us that in 1994, we organized a seminar the School of Architecture about this question, the drop of Florian. Florian. The, the, the thing is an the, the architecture project and history. But we can try and change for project uh, as history, for history as project. Because the history uh, is very stimulant for us. We understand, for example, that the, uh, how, uh, how to the river pass in the past was a lake, a little gap, and then passing a wetland and then transforming in a desert. It's very, very interesting. But uh, mm. uh, it's, it's, it's very important to understand that South America uh, is the vision of Alexander von Humboldt about the possibility to interconnect or the local river with, with uh, Amazonas or the river. Uh, uh, and then in the 19th century of uh, Brazilian engineer proposed this interconnected this river gas. It's very important for build our imaginary very important. Let's put it for think about Frederick the second or Alexander the Peter the Great. Because Peter the Great Russian. Right? Think about the, the dream to link the uh, White Sea, Baltic Sea and Black Sea and create the new city. Of course today if you really think about the idea of Students, we we talk for 
my students, I'm 19 years old, that they stimulate that they have a um, pleasure and honor, honor and, and is a public servant, public officer in the city of Brazil because working with infrast urban infrastructure, uh, public facilities, and social housing. The social housing, housing is infrastructure. That is very important to understand uh, for us this possibility to uh, uh, together with difference build uh, uh, our place. We, we name it architecture of place. The, the first architecture, or oh, the second, the first is avoid the disaster. The second is uh, together with the difference invite, design, and build our place. The second, um, the third also, is architecture of program. Because the architecture of program is a um, quality of authoring. Of, uh, authorship. Authorship. And I like so much the Levy Vygotsky. Levy Vygotsky, young and that 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 uh, 32 years old. But the gods talk about the concept about social development of space. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. About. Then uh, this, uh, this joint research project this for us is very happy to, to, to uh, believe it, you know, believe in what's possible construction a uh, constellation of cultural corners, cultural corners of cultural works, understand like a uh, place where the people meeting So I, I finally, uh, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Kevin, Zag, Eva, if you have any comments before we close the session. I mean, uh, you guys get the last word. You get the last word, <laughs> if you feel like it. I mean, it's not an assignment. <laughs> of course it's an assignment. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Speak. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I think it really, this conference today sort of really expanded my horizons because I felt I feel like a lot when I examine problems like this, I always take this sort of binary approach to looking at solutions like either this or that, or really this sort of black and white look. And I think both projects, both restoring these sort of natural water flows throughout a city and, and looking at the way marshland interacts with, with the city and the urban form itself, uh, looking at these, these sort of non binary approaches. Finding solutions has really opened up doors to looking at other things and other problems and approaching different problems um, in a similar manner. Right. Is, I think the biggest thing for me, um, I'm a student in the engineering school, and um, we we had uh, one one class um, for the, our seminar um, where we focused on like the why history theme. And I think that um, that's something that came up today again, that um, is something that's definitely not emphasized in engineering school is like this historical focus that when you come to um, 
to look at, you know, you have some kind of problem, you're trying to find a solution, the focus is always in the engineering school just to, you know, um, do an economic, a cost analysis study, um, to, you know, think uh, about, you know, direct consequences of, you know, design decisions. But to have uh, a broader focus when you're approaching these, you know, interrelated uh, problems and making like a more developed, or having a more developed understanding of, of problems as a system and um, at, in, as uh, something that happens with context is uh, something I think that's really valuable and something we're working on today. You're, you're an engineer? Yeah. What's your name? Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought the uh, um, you talking about history was really really interesting, and you talking about reverting back to sort of going back to the geography, like uncovering the past geography that's kind of like hidden now, and using that to inform how the cities can change into the future. I think that was really interesting, and I also thought your point about the issue of technology, like just because we have new technology doesn't mean that we forget about the old ones or we don't use the old ones anymore. So I thought integrating new and old in that sense could also be very interesting. Those are two kind of unrelated notes, but the first thing was, um, I just had a thought about what Mario and Angela were talking about, like thinking of this project as sort of like an archeological project. I think that's really an interesting way to put it and I don't know if I, I don't know, from my understanding, I don't know if I necessarily agree just because I think that, well something you said Mario is like, it's about like digging and uncovering something that we know exists and I think that that language is just very interesting and thinking about how it could be used it to justify very sort of violent, um, uh, infrastructural projects. Um, I mean, the idea of digging and uncovering that could be used as sort of rhetorical justification for any sort of like exploitation of natural resources, but it also could be used in a nonviolent way to, in a more natural way to mediate technology and uh, non technological approaches. Um, the other thing I was thinking was um, what do you think they're talking about? Um, economic growth, and I, I mean, we don't really have time to go into it, but I was just curious to hear more about what you're talking about, the unbearable social explosion that will happen if we do not promote economic growth. And I, I don't know, what you said sort of struck me just because I, I don't know, I was very, I, I don't think I, I really agree, I don't mean to be offensive, but I, I don't agree with the idea that um, growth is preferable to avoid a, like an economic freezing you're talking about. Um, I, I thought it was interesting, um, but I, I disagree with the social costs that you think are being um, prioritized in, in development, in choosing development over not developing. But I mean, I don't know enough about it. <laughs> OK, so. Uh well, I thought it was important since you've been here uh, most of the day, all day, probably, uh, near your voices. And uh, anyway, I want to thank everybody for um, their contribution, their presence. And uh, I guess tomorrow uh, the basic team is getting together tomorrow morning for a couple of hours to uh, plan the uh, overall strategy and, and the tactics for the next few meetings. <coughs> so again, thanks and uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.